Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, better. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brad Isaac. I'm um, pleased to be serving as the moderator for this session presented by another Australian, Matthew Collins. At this time, I would like to introduce the speaker. This is a very long introduction, <laughs> so he must be a very important man. Uh, Matthew is the son of industry legend Russell Collins and joined him in business in 1998 after 11 years working in the financial markets as a trader and broker for various international banks and financial institutions. After training with Russell in the personal and business insurance area, Matthew used his experience as a money market trader to include investments in his practice, eventually developing a holistic financial advice firm. Matthew joined the iconic surf life-saving movement at age 13 and immediately started surf boat rowing. He has competed at the highest level in this sport for decades and is a multiple championship winner. He and his crew have just been selected to represent Australia this February as part of the Australian Surf Lifesaving Team. Matthew is a top of the table member and has business production that would have qualified him for top of the table six times. Today, Matthew will share with us how his experience in coaching elite athletes and competing at the top level has helped him achieve success in our industry. This experience is still helping him to cope with regulatory change and public perception of our industry back in Australia. Please note that in these videos, He's the man standing at the back, steering the boat. They call this position the sweep. I'm sure he'll explain what that means. Please welcome Matthew Collins. Thanks, Mark. Matthew Collins will sweep them out. Matthew's just starting there and he'll be talking to the boys. Just say, settle down. Just have a listen to what I tell you. When we get to the white water and I tell you to hold, dig your blades in and pull the boat up. It's like putting brakes on. Then they wait. Here we go. All set for a start. Watch for the tag. That's the slammers. Donnie McManus will drive them out. In they go. Straight away the first stroke. There's the look out to sea. So far a nice open look. Now what he's got to do, when he comes over a wave, he's got to get that sweep bore across the back of the boat. The, the, he doesn't want it to spear one of his crew. See, there he goes. See, push it across the back of the boat. So it angles away from his rowers. Big set coming, big set coming, and there's plenty to come here. Now one crew's elected to go. Wow, they, it's, there it is, the rips. Now watch the white water. See, bang, oh, gets him thrown up. He's lost a crew member. He's out. Oh, what a bad spot to be out. He's got to get him in. Look at this. Tasmania, they'll take a back shoot. No, they don't. They hold her off. Beautiful from Tassie. Up they come the face. Don't they look good in a surf? And they've got a gut ball too. Back they come now on a snow. They survive this time. They're gone. Back shoot and a rollover. Tassie go down. They take a dunking. Out to see the swell still come marching through. Yep. You might not be clapping in a second. There's something I'd like you to notice about the four rowers in that boat crew. And that is that the only person who can see what's coming is me, the sweep. I'm their eyes. And I have to make all the decisions as to when to go and when to wait. The rowers make all of the boat speed. They make the boat go fast. But it's my decision to judge when to go and hopefully to avoid these waves and make it safely out to the turning boys and back to the beach again. So they have to trust me and they have to trust my judgment. That's like a car without an engine. They hold us at this. Oh, spectacular stuff he's got through. But you've got to have momentum. If you haven't got momentum, you're gone. Look at the next one coming up. And they're not at a good angle this time round. Up they go and back they come. They're trying desperately to hold it. I mean, these... So I guess that day they might have regretted trusting me. <laughs> so, after this race, why did those same four guys trust me and continue to compete with me as their sweep? And the answer is that they did trust me. We knew each other well, and they knew that many, many times I had successfully been out and back in surf just like that. They also know that in order to win, sometimes you have to take a chance. Surf's unpredictable. 
Often you can get hit like we're just doing there. And there's always risk. There's risk of injury. Last weekend, I saw one boat crew roll over. Three of them went to hospital. Two of them will never row again. I mean, these things happen. It's unpredictable. There's a risk of getting smashed up by these waves. And there's a risk, which I think is the biggest risk, and that's the risk of losing. And the losing because of the unpredictability and the uncertainty of surf. But these guys knew that I'd been out and back in similar conditions thousands of times and won lots of races. Does this all sound very familiar to you people? Let's think about what we do as trusted financial professionals. Now, as a sweep of many boat crews over a number of years, they know that I've seen lots of crews through unpredictable surf, or to put it in our industry terms, through uncertain times. Now, I've successfully negotiated those uncertain times, and I've won. They can't see the waves that are coming. But those rowers know with absolute certainty that they won't get through those waves without me. They know that I increase their chances of winning infinitely. Your clients are exactly the same. They face an uncertain future. They've never been through the phase of their financial lives that they're in right now before. You know that you increase their chances of reaching their financial goals infinitely. Now, during our time together today, I'd like to talk about building trust. I want to talk about how we listen to our clients and how we show that we understand them and how we can empathise with them. Now, there are people out there in the public who don't know or appreciate what we do. And I hear all the time these days that clients want control and that they want to do it themselves. Now, not all of you will have heard of Don Connolly, but I'd suggest that you look him up. Don Connolly is a great coach and mentor in our industry, and he's spoken a number of times at the MDRT uh, main event in the United States on the main platform. And one time I was sitting at dinner with Don Connolly and he said to me, Matt, when have you ever done anything and been perfect at it the first time you tried it. Now, I ask all of you, put your hands up if you've ever been perfect at something the first time you tried it. No one? I think it's the same for all of us. Now, your clients, whatever stage of life they're at and whatever age they are, they've never been there before. It could be that they haven't paid out a mortgage before. It could be that they've never been off work sick before, let alone disabled long term. And they certainly have never retired before. The difference is your clients only get one shot at it. It's not like kicking a soccer ball when you're a child or playing table tennis and you can get thousands of attempts at practice it until you get it right. They only get one attempt and you ought to tell them that. They get one shot at these things. They've got to get it right the first time. Do they really think that they can do that alone? Do they really think that they can work out the most suitable insurance policies, structure the ownership of that insurance, so that the right amount of money ends up in the right hands at the right time, tax effectively, when it's most needed? Can they structure and manage their investments in a constantly changing environment when they've never attempted it before. Are they really that talented or are they just arrogant? You've been through these stages hundreds of times. You've retired hundreds of times. You've seen people sick hundreds of times. You've seen lots of families through these things. And if you're new in the industry, you've heard the stories on Main Platform today. You've heard stories from your management. You can find some stories out. You've seen it in practice. You've been through this hundreds of times. And I can tell you, your clients don't want to negotiate the rough seas ahead without someone who's weathered that storm before guiding them. Now, your clients, they can go to the robo-advisor. They can get their advice online. They can do their own research. They can go to some cheap discount online broker to trade investments. They can use some online package to work out how much insurance they need and which policy is the cheapest or the best one to take. However, when the surf gets rough, when the market's correcting, 
When the media says that the world's coming to an end, when the television says this time it's different and there may not be a recovery, they need to be able to look someone in the eye who's confident, decisive and experienced and know that that person has their best interests at heart and be confident that that person will navigate them through to better times. That's what we do. Now, I'd just like you all to pause just for a second and with me think about when you've put your well-being or the well-being of a family member in the hands of somebody else. Just think about that for a second. Now, immediately when I ask that question of myself, I think of surgery, a medical procedure. That's an obvious one. So let's think about a family member ourselves having to have a surgery. Now, you have choices. You can look up the procedure online and you can do it yourself. That is, get your iPhone out, cut here. You can do it yourself. That's a choice. You could go to the cheapest doctor that you can find. You can go to a new specialist who's just graduated and in theory, they know what to do, but they've never actually performed the procedure themselves. Or you can go to the person who leads the field, the person who's done it hundreds of times. So what choice would you make? Your clients have absolutely no experience dealing with this complex financial world. They rely on you completely to see them, see them through to their financial goals. And to ensure that their families meet those goals, should they become disabled or die prematurely along the way to the journey to financial independence. Now, during your relationship with any client, there's no way that every day is going to be smooth sailing. There'll be times of turmoil in the markets and in people's personal lives. There'll be times between now and when your clients die where wars will be fought, governments will be overthrown, Terrorists will destroy significant targets. Governments and companies will default on debts. And everybody is going to feel insecure and vulnerable. I tell my clients, though, during these periods, that unless they think that we're going back to the Stone Age and we're going to end up throwing rocks at kangaroos to feed our families, then the world will recover and it'll be stronger and more efficient for the lessons that they've learned during that period. Yes, there's going to be pain. And you need to tell your clients there's going to be pain. They need to expect it. However, if they stick with you, if they stick with me, then you'll guide them to their desired outcome. Now, initially, when I left the financial markets as a trader and joined Dad, like him, I focused primarily on risk insurance. I just did insurance. And after a short time and seeing the quality of the plans written by the so-called investment specialists that we referred our clients to for that sort of work, I did the study and I also started doing investment work as well. Now, shortly thereafter, a client that Dad had written buy sell insurance for about two years before passed away. He was aged 53. He was an accountant. His wife was a homemaker. She hadn't worked outside of the home for some 25 years. And they had three teenage children in private school. So Dad suggested to Judy, the widow, that she come into our office so that he could hand the cheque for the insurance proceeds to her personally, which is something Dad always does. And when I was brand new in the industry, the first day I was in the industry with Dad, he took me along to present a claim cheque to a client. And it was very uncomfortable for me. I didn't know these people. There was a lady there who had two teenage children. This is another, a different lady. And I watched the process as Dad went through it. Dad wanted me to see what we did in practice so that I could put some meaning behind what I was doing every day when I joined the industry. So um, the other thing that Dad suggested to Judy was that while she was in our office, she could talk to me and we could talk about the next stage of her family's life. So Judy and I, just, we met together and we discussed the issues and then we did a budget together of their minimum living needs, which included paying out their mortgage. And we also did a second budget that included their preferred lifestyle requirements 
that included private school education for their children. Now, I'd like you to note the two budgets. This is a technique that I developed further later on after watching a talk given by Tom Hegner on the main platform at the main meeting in 2010, which was titled Paychecks and Playchecks. And you should go to mdrt.org and look that talk up. It was very, very good. Uh, and what we do is we work out what is the minimum amount that people need to fund their life, and that is their basic living costs. And then we do a budget for wants, like travel and private school education, etc. So Judy and I completed the fact find, and I suggested that we meet again in a week. So when I sat down to analyse what she told me, and what was available to her, and what they needed, I did something that came naturally to me. I put myself in her shoes. And I thought to myself, if Judy was my mum, what would she want to know? Judy faced an uncertain future. She was dealing with the emotion of having lost her husband and the uncertainty of having lost the breadwinner. So Judy came back in a week later, and to date, our conversations had been logical, practical, and constructive. So Judy sat down next to me at the table, and I opened the conversation by saying, Judy, I've done thorough analysis since we met last week, and before I get into the detail, I think you should know that based on the legacy that Fred left for you and the children, and the income that you guys are going to need to support your lifestyle and keep the children in private school and to keep the house, you could live to be 102 years old and you won't run out of money. Now Judy broke down crying uncontrollably for 20 minutes. And I sat there not knowing what to do. I didn't know her very well, so I'm thinking, do I hug her? Do I hold her hand? You know, there, there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know her well enough to give her a hug. I'd only just met her. So what was I going to do? I sat there thinking to myself, if she can't get control of herself soon, I'm going to run out of time and I'm not going to get through this document here. But the fact was, she'd already heard everything that she was going to take in that day. She knew what she needed to know. The funny thing is, the one question she did ask me when she got control of herself was, why 102? And she was 52 at the time. And I said, well, that's as far as my software will project. And I said, but I tell you what, when you're 102, let's schedule a meeting now. You can have it with my son, because I'm not going to be in the industry then. But I said, you, can, you and he can then discuss what you're going to do from there. And we had a bit of a laugh about it. But the funny thing is, in the back of my advice, there was a year-on-year -year projection showing how much capital she should have at 30 June, which is our financial year end, at each age, so, you know, 53, 54, 55, 56, right through to age 102, how much capital she'd have. Now, I review Judy twice a year, and when I do, she pulls that page out, she looks at how old she is, and she marries it up and looks at how much capital she should have. And then she looks at the bottom line of the review that I'm giving her and has a look at how much money that she has. And she says, I can still live to be 102, right? And I say, that's right. She remembers it and she looks at that project. Now, we've been through the global financial crisis together. So prior to the global financial crisis, her capital was way above what I'd projected. During the global financial crisis, it was just below. And again, now it's above she's above the curve. So she says to me now, so I can live to be older than 102. And I say, yeah, that's right. So the public are sick of hearing words like trust, honesty, and integrity in advertising for financial institutions or financial advisors. Then in the next hourly news break, the leading story is the same institution being in trouble for or investigation for inappropriate behavior. We have to prove our integrity with our actions, not just our words. So how do we prove it? I say we prove it by looking for the opportunity to show that we care. For example, in my review meetings, I spend about 10 minutes discussing their insurance program, their investment performance, the short to medium market conditions, 
and any changes they should make to their insurance schedule or their investment portfolio. Then I usually spend the next 50 minutes plus discussing their lives, their family, their grandchildren, their children, their favourite football team, whatever. And I tend to uncover more opportunities in that discussion than telling them about some funds alpha or going through the individual investment returns. Now, as people speak, I take notes. I take lots and lots of notes. Now, many of my clients are over age 55. Let's face it, most people who have money are over 50. So let's say during the conversation, they tell me that they're going in for surgery, or they tell me that one of their children's going in for surgery. I ask them exactly what day they're going in and what hospital they go to, and I note that down. If they're going on holidays, I ask them where they're going exactly, when they leave and when they return. And I note that down in my diary when the meeting finishes. So after the meeting, I put all those important dates in my calendar. So the day before a surgery, I'll call them up or sometimes I'll text them depending on uh, the situation and how well I know them. And I'll tell them that I'm thinking of them and that we'll be praying for the best outcome for them. Now, even if people are not religious, they won't mind you praying for them because there's no atheists in foxholes. Now, if they're going away, I wish them safe travels and tell them that if there's anything at all they need while they're away, they should please give me a call or send me an email and I'll be happy to sort it out for them while they're away. And while they're away, I'll keep the economy running for them. Now, another way we build trust is listening and understanding people. I write a training program for my rowing crews each year. And the rowers like to see the program and they like to have input into it. And they want to see that their input was taken seriously and they want to see it reflected in the plan. Now similarly, your clients want to know that you've listened to them and you've heard them because they want to feel understood. People love to be understood. We all have a desire to be understood. So they want to see their input all over the plan. They want to see their opinions and their goals and their values all over whatever you present to them. You should even quote them. Who here, could I have a show of hands, who here knows who Stephen Redgrave is? We've got two, only two people know. So who's Steve Redgrave? Very good, he's a rower. Steve Redgrave is the greatest Olympian of all time. He's a rower. He's the only person that's won a gold medal at five consecutive Olympic Games. Now, rowing's a tough sport. Most rowers are big people because boat speed is created by three things. Power, that is the amount of energy or pressure that a rower can exert on the end of the oar. Length, the range of motion that a rower can exert that pressure over. And rate, that is how many times a minute a rower can exert that pressure over that range of motion. And quite often the first two, being power and length, are dictated by the size of the athlete. So these very big people, and Steve Redgrave's a big guy, they need to be powerful and explosive like a weightlifter or a rugby player, and they need to have the endurance to race flat out for six to eight minutes like a middle distance runner. So to do that takes an enormous amount of mental and physical training. So I want you all to picture yourselves in Steve Redgrave's shoes when he was an 18-year-old man. He works really, really hard for four years to make his first Olympic team. Now, if you think about making an Olympic team, that would be a goal in itself for most people. So he makes the team and he's achieved something. But then he sits his sights on something greater, that is, he wants to win the Olympic gold medal. He wants to be the best in the world. The problem is with the Olympics, you only get an opportunity once every four years to do that. So in 1984, when Steve was a young man of 22 years of age, he won his first gold medal. Over the following 16 years, he had to remain at the top of his game. He had to remain as fit as any rower in the world. He had to develop his rowing technique and his training techniques, and he had to evolve with the sport. Now, in the year 2000, I was at the Sydney Olympic Games live and I watched him win his last gold medal, where he beat the Australians who were favoured to win in the four, men's four, which is a bit of a shame. 
uh, and he was 38 years old. So you think about all those years that he had to remain on the top of his game and he had to remain better than younger and often bigger guys. Now this is the point of the story. When Sir Stephen Redgrave retired, the sports scientists and doctors thought that he might die. He had trained so hard for so long that they didn't know how his body would react to ceasing the workload. So they had to write him a program to train him down over several years. He probably still has to continue to train all the time to this day, I don't know. So let's relate Steve Redgrave's experience back to what we do in our clients' lives. So speaking to people when they're approaching retirement, I ask them the same question, do you know who Steve Redgrave is? Most people don't, so then I tell them the story. And I say to my clients who are about to retire, you've worked flat out for 45 years. Let's think about what you're going to do that's meaningful and constructive to fill in your time after you've taken that trip that you always planned, you painted the house, you played golf twice a week for a year, what are you going to do then? I talk to them about the next stage in their lives and what it might mean beyond money. I mean, we're talking to people about money all the time, but there's more than money to it. They have to cope with more changes in their lives than simply going from a regular paycheck to a retirement pension. So this is talking about preparing people to retire. So let's talk about preparation for a minute. So what I'd like is I need a young, fit male to come up here and help me out. Do I have a volunteer? Come on. You can do it. What's your name? Nicholas. Nicholas. Yeah. I'm Matt. You need to turn that around the right way. So Nicholas, where are you from? Um, Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. I've been there. Great city. Yeah. Nice and tidy. <laughs> So, in that video, oh, he won't need it. We could have a little comedy act. In that video that we watched at the very beginning, you saw the yellow boat, that's Bill Gola's boat, and you saw the guy came down and he tagged the boat, and the guys jumped into the boat. Did you see that? So what I get you to do, can you just hold the front of that chair there for me? You just stand around there. So in order to do a jump start, you're going to have to hold that down because I'm pretty heavy. When you do a jump start in a surf boat, what we do is we put our hands on the side of the boat, we put one leg forward, the other one back, and we crouch. We say when the gun goes up, and they're going to blow the gun, gun goes up, we go down. So let's pretend that this is the side of a fence or anything that's about waist high. I'm sure that nearly all of you could stand next to a fence, drop a... I've got a coin here drop a five cent piece on the other side of the fence and I bet you could jump both feet over it and land on the five cent piece. It's not hard, like that. Pretty easy. Oh, I bet they weren't expecting that when they uh, mic me up. Um, so, you could all do that. This is not gonna work very well, is it? Sorry. Thanks, mate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Nicholas to do that for me. You can do it, mate. We good? Thanks. Oh, don't worry about that. I'm not going to jump again, I promise. Okay, so Nicholas, both hands on here. Now what we do to jump start, this leg back, that leg forward, and you're going to crouch down. I'll hold this so that nothing will happen. When you jump, you're going to put your weight in your hands so that you can control the jump and land on that coin there. Can you do it for me? Yeah. Oh, I bet you can. Ready? Okay. Crouch down. Guns up. Go! Pretty close. You can have it. <laughs> don't, you, don't you go. You can wait here with me. Now most of you could do that. The problem is, for Nicholas, if this was the side of a boat and we're going up and down over waves, I've really mucked this up, haven't I? and we we're going up and down over waves, and this was moving up and down like that, that's going to be a harder thing to jump over, right? Yeah. And what happens is most rowers have this mental hurdle, most people have this mental hurdle when it comes to 
hey guys, can you just re-mic me? Is it coming through okay? Okay, sorry. Have a mental hurdle when it comes to... So they could jump that fence, but when it comes to jumping in the boat, most people can't jump the boat and land in the foot stretches. But you could do it. So when you come to Australia, you come and see me, we'll put you in a boat crew, you can have a right. Now, for being good sport, Nicholas, what I would like to do is give you a copy of my book. But I haven't, writ I haven't written a book, so I'm going to have to give you a copy of my father's book, oh. Skills to Succeed. So my father, Russell Collins, wrote this book. And for life insurance people, it's a must. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Good to meet you. you. You're a good sport. So in order to do a jump start, and jump in the boat when the side of the boat's going up and down, how do we get people over that mental hurdle and make them able to do it? Well, that is they have to go through a process. It's a process of learning how to do that and becoming confident enough to be able to do it. Now, in a start of a surf boat race, that's what we consider the first, jumping in, the first three or four strokes, that's the start. And that's a point in a race where you can gain the most advantage over other crews for the least amount of effort but most crews do it very poorly. Now there's a process to learning the start and there's also a process for learning how to do it and being fast at it. And it takes hours of practice to perfect, except for Nicholas who could do it the first time perfectly. Uh, now listen carefully to this because it's important. Most people practice until they get it right we spend hours of practice so that we never get it wrong. Let me tell you, when all those crews lined up at the start of that race, and any race we go in, when they line up, they all have the will to win. They're all fit, they're all tough, they're lining up, I'm going to win, I'm going to go as hard as I can, I'm going to beat these guys. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. Now, most of you probably don't realise this, because I didn't realise it until a few years ago, but your body operates on three energy systems when it comes to physical exertion. Now, most of you will have heard about aerobic and anaerobic energy. Show of hands, who's heard of aerobic energy and anaerobic energy? We should have been to Ross Walker's session a little while ago. Um, there's a third system in your body called the phosphate system, and that uses energy that is readily stored in your muscles. Nicholas just used it right then to do that little jump. He used the phosphate system. He didn't even know it. So that energy is readily stored in your muscles, and it lasts about six seconds. And if you train that energy system up, it can last about 10 seconds. And it allows for a huge burst of energy or speed that goes back to human beings' survival need, fight or flight. Now... At the start of the race, we call this free energy. That is, we get six to ten seconds where we can go as hard as we want and it will have absolutely no impact on our ability to finish the rest of the race. So most crews don't know that, so they don't train for it and they don't go as hard as we do for the first ten seconds of the race. So we never lose a start because we go through the process and learn how to do it right. We train to be hard and we train to be perfect. And we know that we can exert ourselves at this point without having a huge impact on our ability to complete the race that goes for about four minutes. Now, this is the kind of knowledge that gives us an advantage over the other crews. Your clients are buying your knowledge. You give them the edge you give them the advantage that will be the difference between they being successful or not. For example, I want you to think about the subtle differences in the wording and definitions in different insurance policies and what they can mean at a time of claim. Now, let me put preparation into work context. I had to review a business insurance client once and I noticed that the seven business owners had their buy-sell insurance owned by the company. And I thought this was very odd, and I'd never seen it before. So I thought, well, when I meet the managing director of the company and the financial controller next week, I'll ask them who advised them to set it up this way and why they advised them to do it that way. Now, by strange coincidence, the week before I met them, I went to a seminar on business insurance 
that was run by a leading Sydney law firm on this very subject. And following that seminar, I sought out the partner of the firm and I paid for some of his time so that I could get some advice and some clarity on the subject. So the next week I go and meet the client. And I explained that the way that they had structured their insurance meant that should there be a payout on their buy-sell insurances, for example, if an owner of the business died, the proceeds of the insurance would be subject to 49% tax. And I showed them that if they simply had the cover self-owned instead of company-owned, the tax would be zero. Now, let me tell you, when I told the managing director that potentially his family would have to pay 4.9 million US dollars in tax on a $10 million payment for his equity if he died, I had his full attention. So that led to a meeting the following week with the seven members of the board and their accountants. Now, their accountants are one of the top two accounting firms on the planet. They're a big firm. And these guys were backpedaling at a million miles an hour when they realised that what their initial advice had led to. So as a result of all of that, I got to rewrite the insurance on the seven business owners and the commission on that case was in excess of $140,000. Now, knowledge is power. And in that meeting, I was confident that I had all the power because I had the knowledge and I knew that I knew what I was talking about. I'd paid the price for preparation and education in both time and money because I had to pay the lawyer, but the result was worth it, don't you think? Only just. So investing in your knowledge, it can reward you over and over again. I only had to have one meeting with that lawyer, but I maintained that knowledge for the rest of my life. Now, during a surf boat race, surfboat rowers exert an extraordinary amount of energy getting through the surf and out to the boys. Then they turn around a boy, we all, there's six or seven boats in a race, we all get a different coloured boy that we have to go around, you get your own boy, you turn the boy, you come back in, and you're running with the swell and with the waves on the way home, so it tends to be a little bit easier to come home. Now at the boy turn, what we've discovered over the years is that every rower is in a lot of pain. And they start to question their desire and their ability to finish the race. Now, sports psychologists have discovered that when somebody's in pain, they feel isolated. And once they feel isolated, they feel doubt and they feel insecurity. So at that time, the rowers need to hear their name. They just need to hear some small encouragement that lets them know that they're needed, that they're in a team and that they're not alone. Just think about those words for a second. And think about what it means when, we're on our journey, when we are on the journey with our clients. Pain, like the loss of a loved one, possibly the breadwinner. Or pain when the market's correct and people wonder whether they're going to be able to retire or whether they'll be able to afford private school education for their children or their grandchildren. Now, this pain's going to lead to isolation, which leads to doubt and insecurity, which leads to poor decision-making. So by the time my rowers have pulled 10 strokes out of the boys, I will have mentioned every one of their names positively. Now, my rowers know that I do this. They know that's my technique, but they never make a joke of it and they never mention it because they're scared that if they tell me that they know I'm doing it, that I'll stop. Now, I've got ex-Olympic athletes in my crew. I've got big, tough men. There are guys there that are bodyguards for uh, important people. There are military people, there's all sorts of people, and they are not scared of anything. But all these people get vulnerable and they all need reassurance. Some of the hardest men and women that I've ever known have spoken to me confidentially and asked for reassurance and asked that I make them feel valuable and part of the team at a certain point in the race. So it's the same when your clients are enduring periods of economic or financial pain. Are you going to take the time to speak to them all? Not an email, not a general mail out that goes to everybody, but a face-to-face -face meeting or at the very least a phone call. Because if you do, no technology will ever replace you. Let them hear your belief and your confidence that this will pass. 
let them know that like all previous world economic disasters that were supposedly different, the world will endure and the only certainty that we know is that one day we'll hear on the news or read in the paper that the markets hit a record high again. You partner with your clients, you're a team. When your clients feel uncertain, as Bill Belichick, the coach of the New England Patriots says, do your job. Let them know that you're with them and that they're not alone. Reassure them so that they lose the feeling of isolation. Then they'll follow your advice and they'll make good decisions. It's a little bit like the magic of compound interest. If you think about your plans you do with clients, you meet a young client that's 40 years old, they want to retire at 65, and you do a projection of how their capital is going to increase over those 25 years. It's unlikely when you get halfway to their retirement age that they will be halfway to their capital target because that's not how compounding returns work. And often clients will look at that and they'll think, gee, maybe I should be more conservative. Maybe I should put my money in cash and be more defensive. Now, if that happens, there's only one certainty and we all know it. And that is if they do it, they won't reach their goal. If you put your money in cash, we know what the return is on cash. And we can project with absolute certainty what their capital is going to be when they retire. And it won't be enough in most cases. So you're, you need to tell your clients that they need to stay the course. They need to stay in the race. It's better to stay in the market and be a chance of reaching your end goal than to pull out and be certain that you won't. So my rowers may not always win. They may not always be in a winning position. But I always give them hope that they can win. I keep them in the race. I give them belief. Now, sometimes we have to do what we know is best for a client, even when they try to convince us otherwise. To paraphrase my father, take a stand or take an order. Either they're going to sell you on their solution, or you're going to sell them on what you know to be right. Now, as an aside for you all, it's interesting when I deal with male and female athletes. If I say to the men's boat crew, I want you to run up and down that hill 10 times for training, they'll all do it. They never question me. They never ask why. They just go, OK. And they run up the hill, up and down 10 times. Now, if my women's boat crew come to training, and I say, now, for training today, we're going to run up and down this hill 10 times, the girls' crew look at me like, uh, I don't know what that's got to do with rowing, Matt. And they might do it or they might not do it. They might do it half-heartedly because I asked them to do it. However, if I say to the girl rowers, I want you to run up and down that hill because the muscle groups you're using are the same that you use in rowing. I want to develop some fast twitch. Whatever the, the reason is, I want them to do it. If I tell them why, and I tell them how it's going to make them faster, if they buy into it, they'll go at it much harder than the guys do. So my suggestion to you is, and I'm no expert on women, although, <laughs> um, but I would suggest to you that when you present your recommendations to female clients, if you can explain why it's a good idea for them to do it and what the benefit will be for them longer term, I think you'll get a much better result, and much greater buy-in from them. That's been my experience anyway. So in Australia, much like the rest of the world, uh, the regulators are making our lives more difficult all the time. And a couple of years ago, the regulators brought in a rule where we have to disclose our fees to our clients every year. That is, I have to disclose to my clients how much money I made from them last year and how much money I'm going to make from them next year. Now, most of my clients never read my fee disclosure page in my review. They know I get paid well, and they don't want their noses rubbed in it. My clients want me to be profitable. Who wants a broke financial advisor? People will pay for a great relationship with somebody who cares about them and somebody who understands them. People know, when people know that you understand them and that you share their values, then you can establish a great relationship almost from the first meeting that you have with somebody. Now, when, you, when people know that you care, you can develop a real relationship that's deep and meaningful, that goes beyond money and finance. If you do that, 
then your clients are going to have to think very carefully before they leave you. And they certainly aren't going to be able to replace that with some cheap technology platform. Now, I understand that we're all at different points on our journey in the business. Some of you are just starting out. Others of you have mature businesses that have got regular income streams that you've built up over the years. Now, we've all had to do the study. We've all had to work hard. We've all had to build relationships and networks, and it's all taken time. Now, we're all at different points in that journey in this business, and we've all got obstacles that we have to overcome personally and as an industry. I'll give you another example. The Australian government has just legislated how much commission advisors are allowed to be paid on insurance products, and it's substantially less than insurance pay, uh, companies pay right now. And there's a great deal of speculation about how many advisors will be left in the industry after the new regulations come in and the commission structures take effect. I would say this to you, regulators making advisors' lives difficult is nothing new. Unfortunately, they have absolutely no idea what you and I go through on our journey to success. They have no idea of the hurdles that we have to overcome. They've never been at the coalface. They've never sat opposite a widow and held a hand. They've never had meetings with people like Judy, like I had to have. They've never had to deal with irate clients that are calling up and yelling at you and getting agitated when the market's correct. They don't understand the underwriting process and how difficult and time-consuming that is. And you know what? They don't care. However, if a lot of advisors in Australia leave our industry, those of us that survive will have to be more efficient, but we'll be operating in an environment where there's less competition. So I say, if you're going to leave, go. Be better for me. I don't mind. So uh, what I'd like to do is tell you about my journey in this sport and how the experiences there and the setbacks that I've had to endure in the sport have helped me overcome obstacles in my business life. So I started rowing when I was age... I joined a surf club when I was age 13 and my cousins were rowers and they were older than me and I kind of looked up to those guys. So I started rowing as well when I was 13, which is actually too young legally to row, but I just rowed under a different name for a little while. And when I did that, I immediately pictured myself as national champion. And I knew that one day, my day would come and I'd be national champion. So years passed. Many, many years passed. And even my son won a national title rowing before I did. And let me tell you, he got some miles out of that. He used to sit at the dinner table and say, Mum, when you're at the shops, can you please get some gold medal polish? Dad's got silver polish, but it just isn't doing the job. And he got some great mileage out of that. And he said, it's just not the same, is it, Dad? And I said, I'm sure it's not, son. So in the spring of 2000, I was out training my open women's crew in a very big surf, like that surf you see there at Mona Vale. And we rolled the boat just like we did in that video there. When we came up out of the water, all the girls were yelling at me. They're going, like, my nickname is Rude. If you see me over a few beers later, I'll tell you why. But they're going, Rude, Rude, quick, come over, come over. So I swam over. One of the girls had her eye smashed out. Eyelid, eye, everything had been smashed out of her head. And it was, there was stuff hanging everywhere. It was a pretty gruesome sight. I can remember it like it was yesterday. So I pushed what I could of her face back together and I held her as hard as I could because the surf was big and we rolled around and we eventually got her to shore and I remember visiting her in hospital and I was distraught. I cried. She was lying in bed there and uh, she had her eyes covered over so she couldn't see that I was crying but she said to me, you need to stop crying rude, she said, because I can't cry out of that eye anymore. And I remember thinking, surely with modern science and modern medicine and research, they're going to be able to repair this, they're going to be able to fix it. But unfortunately, the damage was permanent. And I felt helpless and I felt guilty. And those feelings were so strong. 
I remember them like it was yesterday. I can still remember. It still makes me sad now. So subsequently, there are inquiries by Surf Life Saving, and we all had to go through counselling. But she and her parents were absolutely fabulous through the whole thing. But I just couldn't bear the thought of doing that much damage to somebody again, so I decided that I would give the sport away, and I quit. But her family and people in the surf club and people in Surf Life Saving, they rallied around me and they insisted that I continue. That year I came second at the national titles, which was my best result to that point. So the moral of that story is that sometimes we're going to get it wrong. But just like her family forgave me, your clients will forgive you. If they know that you are doing your absolute best and that you had their best interests at heart and their safety at heart, they'll forgive you. So in 2002, I decided to change clubs and I went to Bungan Beach because I was offered the best open men's crew in the country. Now these guys were fast, they were well sponsored, they were well organized, they were young and they were hard. And we had a great season the next season. We won everything. So going into the national championships, which is the big event in Australia, it's the second biggest sporting event in the Southern Hemisphere. Most of you wouldn't know that it exists, but that's a fact. So we go to the Surf Life Saving National Championships. We were heavily favoured to win. So we won all of the elimination races, all the lead-up races. We get in the semi-final. We won the semi-final by a long way. So in my mind, it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to win, we were going to be national champions. It was just a question of going through the race. So we line up for the start, like you saw there. The gun went off, we jumped in, we pulled three strokes, went straight under a big wave and sunk. We never had a chance and we ended up fifth. So as we all tend to do as surf lifesavers, after the Australian titles, we went back to the hotel and we all had a few beers together. So after a couple of beers, I got a little bit emotional. And I'm not generally a sensitive New Age kind of guy, and I don't cry a lot in movies or anything like that. But I went to a quiet corner, and I cried. And unfortunately, one of the rowers walked past, and he caught me out. Now, these are big guys, and he slapped me over the back of the head. And he said, what the hell is your problem? And I said, you know, I've just realized that I'm never going to win. I said, that was my big chance, and I blew it. And I said, you know, there are guys that do this sport forever. There's only ever one winner. There's 500 boat crews show up to the national titles. There's only one winner. And I said, I'm just going to be one of the guys that makes up the numbers. And I said, I know that I'm going to be good, and I'm going to be competitive. I'm going to be the kind of guy that makes winning worthwhile. You know when you've got somebody, it must be really great when... Roger Federer beats the number one in the world. Like, when you have a win like that, that makes winning worthwhile. It makes it satisfying. And I thought, well, I'll be that competition. I'll be what makes winning worthwhile. I'm just obviously not going to be the guy that gets to do it himself. So that became my belief. And true to my word, the next year I came second. The year after that I came fourth. The three years following that, I made the last six. So when you get to the nationals, it always gets down to the last six. And you have a race off for the final to see who's going to be national champion. I made the last six the next three years. And I didn't win because I said and I believed that I wasn't going to win. The fact was that I'd been beaten down so many times that I just wasn't able to get up anymore. Now, from the outside looking in, you would have thought that I was at the top of my game. We were as consistent as any crew in the sport's history. But what I believed is what I became. And it's amazing that Phil Hansen, this morning on the main platform, said what I'd done. I had put a self-limiting belief. Now, it, it wasn't true. I believed that to be true, but it wasn't true. I had no limit. There, there was no reason I couldn't win. Gee whiz, I'd come close a few times. and It'd be that close, but... I believed I wasn't going to, and I didn't. Now, it was about this time that Surf Life Saving Australia called me up, and they asked me to go around the country and run schools 
for people in surf life saving to teach them about rowing in the surf, rowing coaching, steering surf boats and racing and surf skills. So I did that over a number of years and quite a number of the people that I taught to sweep went on to beat me in national titles and win. Now that was pretty hard to watch. Now I was their mentor and I was happy for them and I rejoiced in their success and the fact that I'd played some part in it. But the fact was I felt really ripped off. I felt jealous of these people. Now there's one particular guy that I taught. I taught him how to row. He rowed in my crew. Then I taught him how to sweep. And he's one of my best friends. His name's Bryce Munro. Now Bryce is a natural talent. He grew up in the ocean. He was a nipper. He could surf before he could walk. But Bryce had more than just talent. He had a real dedication and a real work ethic. And he, had, he was a great time manager. Now this work ethic and dedication, I think had been taken away from me somewhat because I'd been runner up so many times. Now Bryce went on to win three national titles in a row in the open man and come second in the fourth, all of them racing against me. He became the most successful sweep in the modern era. So I had some personal issues in my life and I found that I was taking out my personal life on my boat cruise because when you're captain of the boat, you can basically say whatever you like to them and they have to just shut up and live with it. So I was taking out my frustration on those rowers. So I thought, this isn't fun anymore. It's not fun for them. It's not fun for me. So I'm going to give the sport away. Now, Bryce called me up after he found out that I'd given it away and he tried to get me back into the sport. So he dragged me back to Monavale Surf Club because he's mates and because he cared about me and because he wanted me to win one. So he said to me, I've got these really tall kids that want to row juniors. What have I done? I've got these really tall kids that want to row juniors. And he said, if you can train them up, he said, my open men's crew, my champion open men's crew, will give them a head start in the boat relay. And you guys can anchor the boat relay and together we'll win a national title for you. So I said, OK, I can give that a whirl. Taking juniors is good fun. It's not that taxing. Um, it's good fun moulding young people. And uh, so I thought, well, we'll do that together and we'll see how we go. So this is a photo of Bryce and I after we won our first of two consecutive relays together. So I was Bryce's mentor. I trained him. I trained his boat crews. In the end, though, I had to stand on his shoulders to see past my own insecurities. So the moral of the story is, get yourself a mentor. Tiger Woods and Jason Day have coaches. Get someone with some miles on the clock to drag you back into the game when tough times beat you down. And then be a mentor because sometimes the person that you build up might turn out to be very special. And they might build you up to a new height with them. So after the relay wins, I still felt like I wanted to win one in my own right, not in a relay team. And we went to the national titles in Perth in 2014. I must be getting boring. There's a lot of people leaving. Should I talk faster? Um, so uh, in 2014, I'm lying. We've just finished the national titles. I'm in bed. It's 4.15 in the morning. And there's a bang at the door. And I knew it would be a bunch of rowers drunk, and I thought, I'm not answering that. And they kept banging and yelling, and so in the end, I thought, all right. So I got up and answered the door, and Bryce's boat crew came in the door, and they were drunk. Now, I had about a half a case of beer left in my fridge, and they pulled that out, they put it on the table, they opened five cans and sat down and said, we're not leaving until you have a beer with us. And... I said, OK, I can do that. And I was sitting there in my boxer shorts. Let me tell you, I cut a fine figure in a pair of boxers. And uh, so we had a beer together. And they said to me, now, this was not the crew that Bryce had won three national titles with. This was a new crew. And that day, or the day before, they'd been knocked out in the semifinals. So they hadn't won. And they said to me that they felt that they had unfinished business and that they wanted to win a national title. And they said their problem was that Bryce had retired that day because Bryce has four young children and he's got a business that he runs. 
and he didn't have time to do the sport anymore, so he was retiring. And they said they decided that together, myself and they, were going to win our first gold medal together. And I said, that sounds like a pretty good plan. Get the hell out of my hotel room. We'll talk about this tomorrow. So the following season, we had a pretty good year. We won a lot of races. But there were times during the year where we got a bit flat and we weren't winning. And the guys started to question what we were doing. And I kept saying to them, stick to the program, stick to the process, and all that matters is that last race on Sunday at the national titles. I said, as long as we win that one, who cares about the rest? So we went to the national titles. We had four days of racing where we had 10 elimination races and they whittled the crews down until there were six of us left. Now, I used to pride myself on my motivational talks to my crews before we rode in big races. And it used to be my mission to make at least one of them have tears in their eyes before we rode the final. I remember giving a talk once and as I finished it, the Australian national anthem started to play and I got three out of four with tears in their eyes. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm good at this. So I called them all together and they're ready for my motivational talk. And I said to them, these are my inspirational words. I said, you know what race this is, right? And they all said, yep. I said, you remember how much work you did to get here, right? And they said, yep. I said, do you remember waking me up at 4.15 in the morning this day last year? And they said, yep. I said, I think you're going to have to go faster than you did in the semi-final if you're going to win it. They said, yeah, I agree. I said, okay. That was it. For the first time in 33 years, I knew they didn't need to hear anything. They were well prepared. They knew what they needed to do. Old Motorbell Black over the face of the wave and down the front they come. That's the crew on the right hand side, folks. Swept by Matty Collins, Motorbell Black, and they're oh. shooting out in front now. They've got a lead over the rest of them now by some, uh, well, what would that be? 30 metres, 30 possibly more. But Motorbell Black doing it nicely down on the right hand side. It is safe as your house. Up goes Matty onto the chocks, and uh, he's in no danger whatsoever. Coming into the beach now, almost on the sand, Mona Vale Black. Mona Vale Black. So we finally did it. You know, the guys in that crew, we sent, we watched this video. I probably watch it maybe once every two days. <laughs> and we all send each other text messages. We're still in the group text message. And I, was, I sent them a text message. And I'm going to send them one after we finish here. And I'm going to say, we just won in Hong Kong. Because that's what we say, whenever anyone's having a bad day, we send them a text message and go, hey, we won. Just there, the guy who's closest to me, I looked down at him before I threw my hands in the air and I said, I think we won. And he said, yeah, we, I couldn't believe that we'd won. So after the race, the TV cameras came down, they interviewed the guys, they didn't interview me. And they said to the four guys, at what point in that race did you think that you had it won? One of the guys said, well, when we caught a wave and there was no one else on it, I knew we were going to win. And I thought, well, duh. But the other two guys said, on the way out to sea, Matt said, if you can hold your position now, you're going to win. You're the fastest crew in the country rowing home. And he said, as soon as he said it, it was like a weight was lifted off us. And the boat took off. And he said, I knew we were going to win from that point. Now, it's amazing how our words and our confidence can be so powerful. But what nobody knows until I wrote this talk was my thought process at that point. See, as a sweep, you have to think fast and you have to make split-second decisions based on what you feel, what you see, and your experience in the past. So... We started the race, we pulled about 20 strokes and we'd rode over the broken waves and I looked across to see where we were coming and there was a crew from Corumban and a crew from Allura and they were both really big crews, big men and they were very fast and I knew that they were the two crews that were going to be the most difficult to beat and they were in front of us and I thought to myself in, this, in, this, in a moment, I thought, oh, 
here we go again. I'm just making up the numbers. I'm not going to win again. That's what I thought. And then I thought to myself, hang on. These guys never get beaten in the second half of the race. When it turns onto the swells and they start running home, they never get beaten. And I thought, I'm pretty good at this. And these guys are really good at this. I owe them more than this. I'm going to fight. And that's when I said, if you can hold your position now, you'll win. Now, I had doubt. I had insecurity. But the words gave them confidence and gave me confidence. So I'd say your clients have to have the confidence to stick with you, stick to the program and stay the course. The journey of my rowing life has helped me through the journey of my professional life. There's going to be good and bad days in the industry for all of you, but I'll tell you, perseverance will pay off. Keep your clients in the race. You don't have to outperform the market every day. There's times when the market will fall and you'll fall behind. There's times when the market will be down and we'll all have doubt. Your clients certainly will have more doubt than you do. But you know that every time the market's corrected for hundreds of years, it's always recovered and reached a new high. When the media reports negative stories about our industry and 60 Minutes do stories on insurance companies saying that they'll do anything to deny a claim and that they're inherently evil, do your job and stay positive. You've seen the great stories. You've seen it in practice. You've seen the difference claims make to people's lives. If you believe, then your clients believe. They'll stay in the race. They'll stay the course. And together, you'll see them reach their goals. Thank you. Uh, once again, can we please uh, thank Matthew Collins. Before, question, all right, before everyone uh, departs, it looks like half have gone already, we've, we've got until about 5.30 if you want to ask any questions to Matt. Uh, we've got some roaming mics that will come around. Who's got the roaming mics? Just yell out. I'll, I'll repeat or yell out question. if you want. Best question gets a copy of Dad's book because he gave me two copies. Alex. much first of all for your uh, presentation it was fantastic and congratulations on your sporting as well as your professional achievements now Thanks, uh, well done my question is do you see your clients uh, at their place of work or in your own office or do you meet them uh, at, at a neutral place tell us about those interviews and one other question, uh, what percentage of your business is life insurance or risk business as opposed to investment business? Or, or, or does everybody get a very full uh, assessment and, and you look after everything? So thank you again. I'll answer the second part first. Uh, my business would be about, it's, it's about 55% investment now and about 45% risk. But my personal clients, because there's more advisors than me in the office, my personal clients is about 60% risk, about 40% investment. Um, I, I have about 50% of my appointments in the office. But I don't mind going to clients' offices. I like going to clients' places of work because I like to see the environment they work in and I like to see the setup. Uh, it gives me a bit of a feel for them. So I quite like seeing clients at their office. And the fact is, I like getting out of the office. I don't mind getting in the car and going for a drive. So I don't mind getting out of the office. I, I hate being stuck in the office all day. So, you know, it's about 50-50. Have we got a mic here? Hi, good. Hello. Hi, good Hi. afternoon. Um, again, well, thank you for the wonderful, inspirational um, speech, talk you shared with us. Uh, my question is, so you talked about building trust and the client's trust as um, coming from your own confidence in yourself based on your past experiences, on your um, 
experiences with your clients, existing clients. For someone who's been in the industry for a short time only, most of my clients are still very young, below 30. So the, I haven't had an actual claim yet. So I haven't really dealt with death in the family. So all of these things are all um, concepts to me, concepts I believe in. But how do you have any advice um, for us on how to really um, get them to trust us, even if I haven't really done that yet before? That's a good question, and it's, dif it's difficult to answer, except that I would say when somebody in your office or somebody within your company has a claim to pay, go with them. Go and, and see the exchange between that advisor and that client and what it means to them. I had to do an exercise once um, when we were doing a program in Australia, and we had to go and interview some widows who'd received insurance claims we had to ask them some questions about what difference it made to their lives. You could do that too, although it's, a, it's quite an awkward conversation. It's not fun, but it's interesting. And you can share those stories with your clients. When your clients are young, the problem is young clients think that they're bulletproof. They think, you know, I, I thought that too. I played um, A-grade football until I was 35 or something, and I thought I was indestructible. Um, so it's, it's difficult to tell the war stories and make them meaningful to very young people. Um, but, for example, in Australia, I tell people, I ask them if they insure their house. And everybody insures their house for fire and theft and things like that. And I say, did you know that for every house that gets lost to natural disasters in Australia, 48 get lost to disability? And people say, wow, really? So if you can use a statistic like that, then that becomes meaningful for them because they think, well, I see on the news when people lose their house through a flood or a fire or whatever, but you don't hear it on the news when they lose it because they got disabled and they couldn't work anymore. Um, so it's, it's, it, you can only gain the experience by going with more experienced advisors and asking them to take you along. I take our young advisors sometimes on meetings with me and I try to get them involved as well when they're there just to help them out. That might help. You're welcome. This lady here. Thank you. I was just going to ask, um, has your business already started, to, with the changes in Australia, started the transition to hybrid or level, or is that going to have much of an impact on your business, or are you still riding up front? So my father always rode up front, and when I joined the industry, um, I, obviously, I still have the greatest respect for my father. I think he's one of the greatest human beings ever to walk the planet. But um, he wrote everything up front, and I got the impression that he had a job. Because Dad had to show up on the 1st of January every year to make an income because his trailing income was not enough to support the family. So he had to write up front. So I made a decision very early on that I would write what's called hybrid in Australia, which means you get less up front but you get more each year when the client renews. So I had a greater trailing income stream ongoing. So I took the pain up front of not getting that big payment up front in order that I would build a business that would be a bit more self-sustaining. So for the young advisors in my office, it's going to be very painful because they get paid based on new business production primarily. Um, so that's going to hurt them. But for me, I ride hybrid now, so it doesn't really bother me that much. I can't see myself, they want us to switch to fees and I don't know how I could do that. I've, I've heard the talks and people say how they're going to do it and Ash Patterson's here and he's got some great inspirational stuff on how to do that. He's, he's very clever at all of that but I really struggle with the transition to fees instead of commission. I think that's going to be very difficult for me to do if they make us do it. So yeah, I do hybrid now.
So great question. The question is, um, uh, my, my father is a bit of an industry icon when it comes to business insurance. And he does a lot of training in that area still, even though he's 74 odd years of age, he still does a lot of training of advisors in that area. And he's written this book, obviously. Um, and uh, so I've been asked, how, how do we develop uh, referral networks and, and partnerships in order to get referrals into that business insurance market? And I'll answer that two ways. The first way is dad used to run seminars for accountants. And he had, in, at one point, he had about 40 different accountants from different firms that would attend these breakfasts that he would put on. And he would teach the accountants about the importance of business insurance, buy, sell, key person, these sorts of things, how they work, how they should be structured, the tax advantages, uh, different trust structures. And he would show the accountants how, by introducing the idea of insurance, they could actually in increase their own fees as a result. And so he had a lot of these accountants would milk him for the information. But what we found is only the most entrepreneurial accountants were prepared to refer the clients on to him. So of the 40, I think he ended up with about three or four that would give him solid leads. Now, we did a workshop some years ago on doing joint ventures with accounting firms. So what we would do is we'd go to the accounting firm and we would show them what are the dangers to an accountant referring somebody to me? Things like, if I do a really poor job, it'll reflect on that accountant poorly. If I rip the client off, or if, I, you know, if I'm rude to them or whatever, then it'll affect the relationship that that client has with the accountant because they were the source of the initial introduction. Or there's a risk that I might have another accountant that eventually I might refer them to. There are risks that the accountants are thinking in their mind. So you've got to think to yourself, what, why won't this accountant refer clients to me? What, what are the roadblocks here? What are the dangers for them? And you spell it out to them. You say, I understand that these are the risks. And say, this is how we're going to mitigate those risks. And we talk about keeping them uh, involved in the whole process. So every time I give advice to their client, I copy the accountant in on it first. And say, are you OK with this? Do you agree with this? Is there anything from a tax perspective that bothers you about what I'm going to do here? The accountants always say, no, that seems fine. So then if the client goes back to the accountant, the accountant says, yeah, you should do that. That's a good idea because I've already shown it to him. The accountant's already said that's good. Then we started doing these joint ventures where what we would do is we would set up a company where the ownership in the company was 50-50. That is 50% owned by the accountant, 50% owned by my firm. And we had to explain to account accountants because accountants trade time for dollars. So they have a limit to the amount of income that they earn. Whereas we don't work that way. We work on commission. We work on success. So we explained to them that the value of an accounting firm is different with the valuation of a financial advice firm. And what they should be interested in is being involved in only equity in that firm rather than worrying about, because we had these accountants that were saying to us, I'll refer clients to you, but I want 40% or 30% of the revenue that you generate from that client. And I'd say, you know what, and this is the line we, I use now, I say my profit in my business, my profit margin is 27%. I don't know if that's good or bad. I think it's about normal. I wish it was better. But it's about 27%. I say if I give you 30%, I have to run this at a loss. So why would I look after your client? Why would I give them excellent service if I know that I'm doing it at a loss. I'm going to look after a client where I'm getting 100% of the money before I look after your client. So wouldn't it be better if I got, say, 90% of the revenue and you got 10%, but you own 50% of the capital of the company, the joint venture company that we're setting up? Now, I did that with one guy very successfully, and the revenue of that practice built up quite quickly to about $250,000. And he then sold that for three times revenue when he sold his accounting firm and I continued the joint venture with the next practice. So he got to see in real life that that worked out. So we do the joint venture company. Dad never did the joint ventures. He just wanted them to refer them to him because he was good. And uh, he did a lot of work before, you know, he had to turn over a lot of stones before he found those three or four that would refer people to him. But to this day, those same three accountants still refer to me. They're very loyal to him because he spent a lot of time building up that 
rapport and relationship with those people. Um, so that's, and he, he looked for accountants that deal with business owners. You gotta find entrepreneurial accountants because they will attract entrepreneurial clients. You gotta find accountants that deal with small to medium business enterprises. You know, people like you. Accountants like business owners, we're business owners. They like them. You know, treat them like a business owner, they'll treat you like one. Okay, we're nearly done, I We've think. We've got any more questions? From anyone who's not from Australia? <laughs> They've probably already got one of Russell's books. Oh, you'd have to go, you'd have to go online. <laughs> yeah, but you can have this one. Because the Aussies would already have one. <laughs> If they don't, they better get one. That's, this is my inheritance we're talking about here. Well, guys, that, um, if we can thank Matt once again, that concludes our session. But if you really want to, um, the, probably the best way to talk to Matt, if you do know him, is um, over a beer at the bar, and you'll get some pretty funny and maybe some more honest answers. So uh, we'll be at the Grand Hyde at the bar, and uh, it's a good place to catch up with him. So that concludes our session.